In the seven years that we've been living in Korea, we've come to realize that your identity isn't just determined by your family and your upbringing. Even if you move to another country, as a grown ass adult, you could have your tendencies and your identity change significantly. So today we want to talk about ways that Korea has changed us. And we don't mean in like a culture shocky kind of way. Mm -mm. We mean like beliefs and tendencies that have completely shifted in us. Also, I'd like to mention that we might be semi disgusting in this video because we have a cold. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. That's been just like <clears throat> going around. Everybody that we know has it, so I'm sorry if we sound a little congested today. Yeah. I know an immediate belief that has shifted in me that I cannot believe. I didn't even know when it happened. Yep. You know what it is? I don't even know the transitional part of it. I love white rice. Rice is so delicious. Before, when I was growing up, I barely ever ate rice. Yeah. I found it boring, but there's something now about a warm, steaming bowl of white rice that makes me feel like my family loves me. Okay. It's just, well, I know they do, but I feel it more when I see white rice. I don't think what's weird about it is that this is not an immediate change. No. Like, this was, we, we used to complain all the time about oh, yeah. Yeah. White rice, not having any bread. I we remember We fought against this for so long. Like we tried to like, like cut it out in our lives, but now it's yeah. just like we need to have white rice. And you know, we didn't realize this was such like a strong pull until you leave Korea. So yeah. when we left Korea to go on like our Ichi Kimchi tour or yeah. even to Europe, I found myself being like, Where can I get a nice bowl of white rice around here? And when people would give us rice and this is long grain bullshit, I don't want that. I want the sticky stuff. I want to like wrap it with kimchi. Oh. I I want to wrap it with seaweed, Roasted with seaweed. my chopsticks. It's, it feels like it's right. It should be nutritionally devoid. That's uh, what yes. I want. I want the most nutritionally devoid yes. rice that you can hand me. Give it to me. Speaking of eating, I firmly believe that this is a universal truth that can be proved by science through very, very many algorithms and theorems. Chopsticks are the superior utensil. Yep. Hands down, forks and knives are so barbaric. Why am I stabbing food? Why am I destroying it? I want to pick it up gently. Like chopsticks mm -hmm. work so much better okay. in every situation. For things that you're not even thinking of. Yeah. Okay, so for example, do you remember the first time on our birthday that uh -huh. uh, my coworkers came out with a cake and then they handed out chopsticks to everyone? Yeah. And I was like, should I get like a fork or something? No, no, no! You take a chopstick and you like stick it in the center and you cut with and it. And you just pick up the you cake with your chopsticks. It's so much better. And it picks up the fluff and uh -huh. like the strawberry in one bite. Salad. Salad is so much okay, easier. You got a fork and you're like violently jabbing the cherry. You tomatoes. don't have the cherry tomatoes that are like, no, you can't get me, you can't get me. Can't. No, you pick up the cherry tomato with your chopsticks. That's what it does. Cherry tomatoes don't want to be stabbed. Also spaghetti. You need a spoon. Yeah. You need to twirl it like into no. a spoon. You like... pick it with chopsticks, you like spin it around like this, and you got a nice little yeah. like spaghetti ball on your chopsticks. You yeah. eat it. It's better. There is only one scenario in which I would say that you need a fork knife. That which would is... be for like a piece of steak that you get in like a giant slab and you have to cut yeah, it. Yeah, but you but cut, then you cut that it, first, and then, then you, you throw use... that shit away. <laughs> the fork and knife that is. And then you pick it up with chopsticks. Yeah. That's how it's supposed to be done. Chopsticks. Chopsticks are the way to go. Now this next one is something that has happened to Martina. I still haven't been converted yet. Okay, so when we were visiting my family in Canada, I yeah. remember we were watching a movie uh -huh. and I just curled up on the ground to watch it. And my mom's like, we have a couch, you know. We bought furniture. And I got up and sat on the couch and was like slowly <sighs> slid what? off the couch onto the ground. <sighs> like a baby that doesn't want to be held. <sighs> just uh, arms up and you slid down. I think that couches are very comfortable. I enjoy them, but maybe it's because our, our dining room table in our house in Korea is uh -huh. really low. Yeah. When I sit on the couch, I don't like the leaning to get stuff. I just want to be on the ground. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy sitting on the floor. I enjoy eating food from that mouth level. I like Spudgy being able to waddle up and put his little face on my lap. I like sitting on the floor. That's you. I still can't sit on the floor. So that's that's Martina-ism right there. That's probably because your legs are so big that when you try to sit on the floor, you like lift up the table and people are like, what's going on? And I know there's a dick joke in there somewhere. My but I will say that this other thing that we've been resisting for a while that has snuck up on us that I have succumbed to as well, yep. ondol heating. Oh man. I used to just think that it was overpriced and not impractical. really worth it, impractical. But now when winter comes, like I turned on my ondol like two weeks ago. Didn't even need it that bad. It was just a little bit chilly, but now it's just like the floor is all mm. warm and heated you and luxurious. Like, because you walk without your socks on and you're like, my toesies are cold. Yeah. And you're like, we should just turn the ondol on a little. The floor it's all like warm and toasty like I won't sit on the floor but I'll lay on the floor and I'll roll around on it and I'll purr and I'll lick my and I won't do that 
And the next thing that I find that I'm actually actively trying to resist but I can't is that I will bow to anyone and anything if you make eye contact. I just, these little short bows I do all the time. I never used to bow in Canada, but Hello, now- Hello, Mr. Pigeon. I just, hey, hey there. Is that a, hey dog, what is it? Tree, hello tree. I just like, not the full bows, but I just do these little like, like chicken bows all the time. And I don't know why I can't fight it. It's a part of my soul. And it is the essence of being to bow all the time. I remember when to Japan and we were meeting other white friends. Yeah. And when we're like, hi, nice to meet you. We are like, yeah. nice to, and then we just look like hey, these dumb, weird, I don't, I don't like, got to bow to you. I you're, just handshake yeah, you. Yeah, this is a handshake, but then, but the handshake then you handshake and like bow. <laughs> and you like move your hand with your body at and the same time. And then you don't time. know, then it turns into a handshake with the arm. Yeah. And then you're like doing this whole And it's just like people like, from the outside are looking like, what are these weird white people doing? And I don't know. I can't stop it. I'm trying not to. I will say that I've read online that this is a habit that will be unbreakable. Yeah. I've read that people <clears> have left Korea or Japan or uh -huh. other Asian countries like years ago and mm. all of them still do the hand thing yep. or the bowing. Yep. It's like become engraved in them. Yep. It's bizarre how all of these things that we're talking about are subconscious things. It's not something that we've actively tried to do. It's just something that like you said, like we mimic without knowing it. These are yeah. parts of us now that we didn't necessarily want to be parts of us, yeah. but we can't avoid anymore. Now there are a few more ways in which we've changed without necessarily wanting to, especially our driving habits, but we're going to talk about that in a blog post. So make sure you click on the link here if you want to see how I've become driver of the year. <laughs> it away already. Have I? Yeah, driver of the year in Korea when we go back to Canada. <laughs> so our question for you today is for any of you guys that have lived overseas, and I don't just necessarily mean leaving North America to go to like an Asian country. Mm -hmm. What if you're Asian and you went to North America or Europe? Right. How have the countries changed you in ways that maybe you like or don't like? Let, Let us, us know. hear in the comment section below. I heard that your dad is in love with Italian dressing. Well, I'm not sure if he still is, but there is a while in which I gave us Italian dressing for everything. Yeah. And when did yeah. he get to Canada? Oh, he got to Canada when he was 38. Yeah. So suddenly it's like, yeah. I address it. Oh, and bridge. He loves playing bridge. No, but he loved that in Poland. Did he? Yeah. I take it back. You should apologize to my father right now. He's watching. Sorry, Mr. Jackie. You make really good banana bread and I miss it. No, I hate your banana bread. It's so good. Never make it again, Dad. Bread. Don't you dare. Dad, no, no. And the bird's milk chocolate. Ptashi mleczko. That's a good. Polish thing. Some. There you go. Send me some I'll pierogies. agree to that. I really miss your pierogies. Okay, I agree to that and too. And homemade wine. Uh, ship it on over. Maybe. The bird milk chocolate. Okay, bye, Dad.